Hey, everybody. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you said I was going to do it. <laughs> you said I was going to do it. Well, Jason, what did he say? Jason. <laughs> I, yeah, just, hi, I'm Jason Fickner. Welcome to their show. <laughs> That's a new one. We'll go with that one. And the show is Retire with Style. I'm Alex, and I'm with... Wade. And we're happy this week to introduce our, our special guest, Jason Fickner, who does wear many hats, including positions with the Alliance for Lifetime Income, the, the Bipartisan Policy Center, uh, in the past, the Social Security Administration. And I'm interested to ask Jason about that, having worked there myself for a while, which he may not know, I'm not sure. Uh, and just a, a number of different things with, with the Alliance for Lifetime Income, in particular, the Retirement Income Institute. He's uh, been a lecturer at John Hopkins University. He's worked at George Mason University. So he has quite an extensive background. And Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you, uh, Alex and Wade. I appreciate being here. And, and sort of as Wade you know, mentioned, I wear a lot of hats these days. And so sort of the three hats that are all relevant, one, you know, that the day job is as vice president and chief economist at the Bipartisan Policy Center, uh, which works on a variety of economic policy issues from retirement security, energy policy, infrastructure, health care, immigration. We kind of do it all and try to advance legislation in a bipartisan manner because we believe that the only way legislation becomes stable is if it's done in a bipartisan way, not one party pushing it over the other. And then mm -hmm. you know, Wade also mentioned, uh, I'm a senior fellow with the Alliance for Lifetime Income, uh, where Wade is also a senior fe a fellow. And in that capacity, I run the Retirement Income Institute for the Alliance. And we can talk about that, obviously, today. And then sort of the third hat I wear is I'm on a newly created Puerto Rico Pension Reserve Trust, uh, which came out of the PROMISA Act and Puerto Rico's bankruptcy, because the defined contribution plans for public employees were basically speaking bankrupt. And as part of the bankruptcy agreement, they created a new trust, which has contributions coming in from payroll taxes uh, from the government, and then some money that is now coming into a trust of which I'm a member, which we are managing that money in private investments. And as the contributions of a now closed defined benefit plan start dwindling as the current workers retire, there would be no one to pay for those retirees. So we're building up that asset base to pay out those benefits uh, when they retire. And it's a kind of a mix of public private, uh, which is, I think, interesting and might have some sort of implications for Social Security reform down the road 10 years from now. So those are the current jobs. And as Wade mentioned, I have a long history doing retirement and tax issues. I was the principal deputy commissioner and chief economist of the Social Security Administration. I have served as a senior economist for the Joint Economic Committee of the United States Congress. I've worked for the Internal Revenue Service. I've worked for Arthur Anderson and the Federal Tax Services. I've taught at Johns Hopkins, Georgetown, Virginia Tech, and George Mason. And there are probably a few jobs I forgot to mention along the way. Uh, but it's been a very wow. interesting career. And, and my passion is retirement security and making sure people have enough income in retirement to have a dignified and meaningful uh, and secure retirement. And that's the work you guys are doing too. So I appreciate being able to come on the show and talk to you about your work. No, th that's great, Jason. And Jason, there's one more. We'll, we're going to talk about these in, in a second, but there's one more calling that I think you missed. A, a, an, an intro you, you, you did a great intro under duress i mean you really just waiting there looking at each other you just said the hell of it i'm taking over and you did a great job Talk about the 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 we can't decide how to kick it off i'll do it for them <laughs> i like it I, puerto rico's in good hands puerto rico's in good hands <laughs> leadership leadership means you go first so i guess i'll leave it <laughs> <laughs> well, I just eat last. That's my <laughs> that's, that's my philosophy now. Uh, uh, wait, I don't know how to take it from there. Why don't you, why don't you find a nice transition? Well, well, Jason, at Social Security, were you in Baltimore or were you actually in the, the Division of Economic Research Office, the small well, the office? The answer to that question, Wade, is yes to both. So okay. the, the way, you know, Social Security's headquarters, of course, in Woodlawn. Uh, and then they had a DC office. So I spent basically two days a week in, in Woodlawn, two or three days a week in Washington and kind of went back and forth as need be because the operational component of the agencies run out of, out of Baltimore, out of Woodlawn. And then the mm -hmm. research office was actually split. There were folks in economic policy in Woodlawn and some in DC of our alleged affairs folks. Uh, and I oversaw the research component as well. So I spent time in both. Uh, and that commute from DC to Baltimore, <laughs> never very good. Yeah, it's yeah. a beautiful I spent parkway. The summer of 2001. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful parkway, but... <laughs> especially when you're sitting there not moving. You get to see, you know, I'll, I'll... you get to watch the trees grow. Yeah. 
Well, probably the the biggest uh, thing to talk about today is just the work going on with the Alliance for Lifetime Income. And anyone uh, listening to the show who may have attended a Rolling Stones concert in the last few years, or this <laughs> year in particular with Elton John, may have seen the Alliance for Lifetime Income, may have seen either a print magazine um, advertisement or on television, the different ideas around. I know the one I remember really well was the race car driver who talked about taking risk with her career, but not wanting to take risk with her investments, speaking to, well, the idea that retirement income risk is a completely different matter from other types of risks. But could you just tell us a little bit more about the Alliance for Lifetime Income and what this, uh, well, the advertising was really meant to accomplish and then more broadly, the, the goals of the Alliance? Yeah, no, thank you for, for allowing me to do that. So the Alliance for Lifetime Income is a nonprofit educational organization. And I think it's important to realize that it is an educational-based organization. And the idea is to create awareness and educate Americans about the value and importance of having protected lifetime income in retirement. And, and I think part of this is the switch that's been going on because we had a system in the past that was basically based off Social Security and defined benefit plans. Uh, these are the pensions. And most people who had pensions usually were in either large corporations or in the public sector and government. And now it's really hard to get a pension, whether you're in the government or in the private sector, they're going away and we've shifted to a defined contribution world. And this change was necessary in a way because a lot of the defined benefit plans were underfunded and people just didn't have then the secure income they did in retirement but as we shifted to a DC world, a defined contribution world, we shifted that risk onto participants, people who now have to manage their money and when they hit retirement, have to manage that asset base for the rest of their life in retirement. And for the longest time before the Alliance came around, the work that you, Alex, Wade, and I've been doing, it was more trying to tell people, you need to save a number, pick a number, a million dollars. And people saw that was really daunting. And we didn't tell them how to manage that money. We had things like the 4% rule, which we've all written about how it's problematic and probably not a bad, probably not a good rule of thumb that you could draw 4% of your assets down a year and rest, it would last the rest of your life. Not think about what happens when you have a market downturn, for example. So the alliance was created to talk about how income should be the outcome in people's retirement. And how do we talk about how you save enough money so that when you get to retirement, you can convert that into a stream of income that will last the rest of your life. It doesn't have to be full annuitization or even partial, but it's how to use that to augment social security we're talking about social security claiming strategies, and we're trying to change the narrative, which I think we've done around annuities and protected income. For a long time, if you talked to individuals and you went out there and surveyed them, I did this at social security, we talked to real people. And I say, would you love to have income that would last the rest of your life? I said, I would love that. Would you like to have a paycheck for the rest of your life? I would love that. Would you like an annuity? No, I don't want one of those. <laughs> and the information, the educational awareness was off, including with financial advisors who thought there was only one annuity product and they were all bad. They didn't realize you could customize. There were so many products out there that you had to have more nuance and awareness of individuals' risk profiles, their needs, what products were available, what problems they needed to solve with various solution sets. So the Alliance provides consumers and financial professionals with these educational resources, interactive tools. I like to call it practical or actionable research and insights into how to build retirement income strategies and plans. And we believe that annuities are just one of a source of protected income. Again, Social Security is another one, for example. And we're trying to put this all together to help people have, again, a dignified and secure retirement. And, and it is an educational mission. And I think it's also important to realize that we are consumer facing as well. Like we are here on behalf of consumers and individuals. We are trying to make sure that the in retirement ecosystem works for everybody. We know it doesn't today. And so we're talking you know, about how to put protected income better aligned with in-plan strategies for defined contribution plans, how to actually make um, products more accessible, how to better educate people on their awareness, both again, from the consumer side and the financial professional side, and talking about how do you talk to a financial advisor? How do you find a financial professional? What information should you know? And, and the research that shows how people can be better off under various income strategies. Uh, and that's sort of the work that the Alliance is doing. And it's been really gratifying and rewarding to be a part of this organization and, and the work that you guys have been doing for it as well. I really appreciate you being a part of it because I think we are actually making a difference. And, and the last thing I'll add before letting it come back to you is again, I wear a lot of hats, but they all kind of fit together. 
And, and the one thing with the Bipartisan Policy Center is we run a campaign coalition called Funding Our Future, which has a variety of partners, including the Alliance for Lifetime Income, which tries to make sure people have adequate savings through the life cycle, including retirement. And the savings retirement ecosystem is one of the areas left that is still truly bipartisan. And you can think about this in the SECURE Act, SECURE Act 2.0, which is being considered on Capitol Hill right now. You talk to Republicans, Democrats, independents, mm -hmm. they're all in favor of retirement security. How you get there, of course, is open for policy discussion and debate, but no one's against it. So how do we use that bipartisan energy to actually move the needle? And that's part of the alliance is about, you're about, I'm about, and it's really rewarding to be part of the entire process right now. That's well said. Fantastic. Uh, the, it's just a comment for Wade off of this because you were talking about the race car driver. Jason's a big motorcycle guy, yet he's a proponent of protected <laughs> income, right, Jason? Well, if I remember because correctly, I, I, I'm going to live forever, Alex. I mean, this is one of those things where I always tell people I'm planning to live forever, and so far it's working. There you go. There you go. <laughs> no, that's great. I and, and I I don't I I'm not sure. I, obviously, there've been the promotions with Elton John, Rolling Stones, and and just to get out there and get that mind share going. If and you know, just like in in this podcast, we have a fair number of consumers as well as professionals. Uh, a consumer, they, they go to the website and we'll have a link for it and, and the like. What would you recommend for them to be their first step as they go on this journey of, OK, let me find out a little bit more about this and, you know, what tools, tips and tricks, you know, whatever is, is available there. And then the same could be said for an advisor person. An advisor goes on. What what path do you think is the most useful for them as they sort of peel that onion? Yeah, no, th th thank you for the plug for that. So. The, the web address is, you know, protectedincome.org. So if someone goes to protectedincome.org, there'll be a lot of stuff on the front page, but go to the top right-hand corner and there's that menu bar, right? The menu bar is where you always want to start. If you pull down the menu, there's an educational section that says learned and it says, you know, annuities explained real stories. So we talk to real people about how protected income actually helps them manage and have a secure retirement. Links to articles, research, and videos. Um, we have tools and guides are part of that is the educational. And we have a link also under, again, the menu, to how to find a financial professional, which I think a lot of people feel daunting. They don't know how to find one or how, what questions to ask a financial professional. We have those checklists online. And then there's, of course, links to the Institute, which has our research base. which We can talk about the research that's there as well. For financial professionals, there's a lot of information there, too, which they can click on because it talks about how many Americans are concerned about their finances and how they don't know how to talk to a financial professional. They don't understand what information a consumer might naturally want or how to actually engage with them. So we provide financial wellness checklists. We provide access again to the research. So there's a component for financial professionals as well as consumers. And there's a resource center. So I would say go on the website and just start clicking around and, and seeing what's there and seeing what might actually be some educational material you want and then reach out to people uh, when you have questions. No, no, I, I think that's fantastic. And I, I would add to that what, what you said at the beginning, which is it's it's a nonpartisan sort of side. It's, it's, it, it, it's nonpartisan it's, and it's a nonprofit, right? So we're, we're not, yeah, we're not exactly. charging for it. All, all this information, by the way, is, you know, there's no such thing as free to an economist, but there's no charge to use <laughs> it. You can leverage it. You can, you know, you can quote it in the media. You can send it to all your friends. We don't charge for it. We want this information out there. We want our partners to use it. We want media to use it. We want to get it out there. And one of the things I've always had, you know, as an academic, I have a PhD and I've taught at universities, a lot of the academic journals require sort of this exclusivity. Like you can't access it unless you pay for the journal. We don't do that. Everything we have on the website is for public consumption. Everyone can use it. So we want that information out there. No, thank you. And Jason, uh, Wade, actually, when I got on the site initially, he said I, could, I can make $20. But then he turned around and said, no, but don't bother, because when you get it, it won't be there. I, I don't know. It was one of these weird. <laughs> He's weird just trying comments. to get you to pay him more for his work. That's all. Oh, uh, and, and we, in terms of, right, <laughs> and in terms of research, what, what, uh, something that I found, because Wade and myself, we, we, we published a few papers on this, and we'll get to it later. But what I, what I found you know, extremely interesting and actually gratifying from the standpoint of doing good you know, to see you had these research themes that you wanted proposals to hit. And and I think it's good for consumers because one of the, as, as we've interviewed folks all, all over the last few weeks, a reoccurring theme is that 
there are a lot of professionals that are actually out there doing good. A lot of financial professionals doing good for 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 consumers, if you will. And when I read that call for papers, that that weight actually sent my way. It was like, wow, this is this is pretty amazing. And and I I think it's worth just really just maybe going over some broad brushstrokes of the themes that you're trying to accomplish within your research to help promote this retire with dignity, which is a phrase that I've heard a couple times lately, not just from you, from others. So maybe it's one of these things that's building momentum. But it's a great, great phrase. But if, if you don't mind just going over, what, what are some themes that you that you from a research perspective that you're trying to to check the box on? Because I, I think those were quite moving when I when I read them the first time. Let me let me address sort of you know some bigger buckets and then drill down. Yeah, of course. To understand. So so one are some of the behavioral insights about retirement and how you know from the economist standpoint we all talk about the rational actor model, right? Everyone always acts rationally, and you look at the world and go, well, what you thought was rational wasn't really rational, but maybe at the time you thought it was, but it really it's not good behavior. How do we help people make better informed choices? And then for those who just act on impulse or emotion, how do we have defaults that prevent them from doing something like that when it's not in their best interest? And I'll give you an example of this. We have a great paper out uh, by David Blanchett. Um, and he did some work and he calls it, what helped participants stay the course in 2020? So COVID hits, right? And the markets crash. And, you know, you and Wade have talked a lot about, you know, market risk and sequence risk. And that, you know, if you're thinking about retiring, you know, if you retire at 65 and there's a market crash or, you know, a recession 20 years and you're 85, you've had 20 years to build up some more assets to weather it. If you retire at 65 and that's the year COVID hit and you lose 20, 25 percent of your assets or it was the financial crash 2008 and you lost half, you're not in the same good position anymore. And you might be feeling really emotionally, behaviorally nervous and you might sell your assets as you're afraid of losing more. And of course, selling near the bottom is the worst thing you can do. So one of the research we've, we've uh, commission and David Blanchett was one of the ones who did part of this was what helped participants just weather the storm like this behaviorally. And what we found is that for people who had protected income, right, higher social security payments, maybe some annuities or a defined benefit plan, they were getting this level set of income coming in regardless of market fluctuations. So they knew they had enough money to spend on their utilities, their rent, their 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 main essence of living, and even maybe some. Uh, Cons consumption activities like travel, that they didn't feel like they had to sell the market. They knew they could wait it out. And, and that's what we're trying to show protected income, how we can use these behavioral strategies and, and have people work with their plan sponsors to develop these products so that people can basically not have to trade into a down market. And we also found that like when the working years, like when we're all employed, think about those who are now who are not retired, but we're just working. We get a paycheck. And that paycheck becomes our budget constraint in economic language, right? We basically get a thousand a month, five thousand a month. If you're really lucky, maybe you're getting ten thousand dollars a month or more. That's Wade. That's Wade. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, that's kind of your constraint, and you you save some of them, you spend up to it. And, and what we kind of found that for people who have protected income strategies, again, whether it's partial annuitization, annuities, Social Security, um, pension plans. That became what they called a license to spend. And this is you've had Michael Fink on the that's program before. David Blanchard, again, it's a license to spend. They feel they can spend up to that. So we're doing research that says, how do we talk to people about showing them the empirical evidence that these strategies can help you weather financial storms, make sure you spend adequately, because again, part of having a dignified retirement is you don't want to overspend, but you also don't want to underspend, right? Some people yeah. are so worried about outliving their assets, they don't spend enough and they die with too much money. Uh, I mean, great problem to have, right? Unless you sacrifice too much in your retirement years. So how do we find that balance? So we're doing research on that and those papers are on there. From the financial planner side, we're also making sure people, the financial professionals understand sort of the intersection of wealth and health. And what we're finding now from the financial side. Another good phrase. Side, well, it, but it's important to think <laughs> yeah. about. Because no, absolutely, absolutely. You, you could hit, if you're an individual, you could hit a, have a, a health shock that really could be very expensive to your retirement security going forward. From a financial professional standpoint, financial professionals have to be cognizant, I use that term on purpose, that their clients in retirement could start showing signs of dementia and Alzheimer's. What is the role of a financial professional if they see that? How do they start helping that person talk to family members, make a financial plan, make sure powers of attorney are involved? It's more than just the investment. And then from the protected income side, 
if you have more protected income strategies as you start getting into health issues, that may provide the buffer that can pay for either assisted living or additional health care when you need it most and you're not dependent on market fluctuations to then pay for those payments. So, so then that research is focused on just how to have those conversations or research it, it, focus on, hey, there's going to be an in inevitability that you're going to have it, to face. It, it, it is both. <laughs> it is both, right? Because we don't know, like, again, you said I ride, I ride motorcycles. You know, I hate to think that that's actually a risky behavior because for me, it's cheaper than having a psychiatrist. It's mental health for me. Um, but wait, it, but wait, it that, wait, wait, hang on. Wait, that's called rationalization. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go, go on, Jason. <laughs> uh, I, my life too. Uh, <laughs> I do, I do rationalize it. And, and, and again, but I, I'm still planning for a retirement that will last until I turn age hundred at least. So sure. could I, could I walk out of here after this interview, you could hit by a bus? Yes. Um, I feel but, so bad if something now happens. <laughs> tell me, I'll feel even worse. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But we, you have to sort of make these plans. And I think the problem we're seeing with a lot of people is they don't know how to have these conversations about saying, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'll give you back to the days of Social Security, you know, Wade. We had this um, conversational piece, an educational double-sided uh, page we called when to start receiving retirement benefits. We wanted people to think about Social Security claiming. But we also wanted to tell them and remind them that Social Security as a program was not just retirement, it's also a disability insurance program. Ah, and, yeah, yeah. you know, when I was there 10 years ago, there was a one in four, sorry, a one in five, and now it's going to almost one in four chance that someone mm -hmm. who is 24 to 55 will be disabled in their lifetime. Now, disability comes in a lot of factors, right? It could be temporary disability, but you start telling somebody there's a one in five or one in four chance that you'll have some sort of disability in your working life. Have you planned for that? And, and they just, how do you have that conversation? Like, well, one in four, well, three and four won't. Yeah, but one in four will. And you start thinking about people who aren't even saving for today. They're like, oh, I'll, I'll wait till I have higher income in my 50s and I'll play catch up. It's what probably worse than, I don't know what, I don't know what the seatbelt kind of probabilities are, but, you know, I yeah. would imagine those numbers are kind of easier on the probabilities than this particular item that you just said. Yeah. Or having a, having a late career layoff. We're going through a time now where we're starting to see companies lay off individuals. And so, you know, part of this is, is, is having a plan, right? People, what I always like to say is people don't plan to fail. They fail to plan. So having a plan, working with financial advisors, thinking about these things and walking through what are the various sort of scenarios I need to actually be worried about, or at least concerned about from a financial planning standpoint. So I'm prepared for it if it happens. And again, if you plan for the worst and the best happens, all you do is come out ahead. And I think that's no, the important part. So then the two themes so far is the, the behavioral stuff, just how to stay the course or how to kind of get out of your own way, better said. Yeah, and and then is, how health is going to intersect with this. Yeah, and then uh, the, important, the importance of savings in general, right? How, how to think about employee wellness and, and what's the responsibility. So some of the research that I've done, for example, and, and the paper is on the Institute website, is called the Peak 65. And so oh, yeah. we're at a time today where 10,000 people are turning 65 every day. In 2024, we hit our peak moment, which is when 12,000 people a day turn 65. That creates fiscal challenges for the government. It creates people's, you know, challenges for retirement security. It changes sort of the, we think about people's consumption patterns, right? They go away from education, more towards healthcare, maybe yeah. travel, leisure. But we're seeing it at a time when DB plans are going away. For many people, they're not adequately funding their defined contribution plan. Social Security is facing financial problems. I, for everyone, they're, it's not going bankrupt. But This but is another it, podcast, by the way. We're going to have you on again <laughs> with this. We're going to have a whole arc. So whole you may be a recurring security. theme on that one. But Social Security is not going bankrupt. Fair warning. But, but by law, if nothing is done, benefits will get reduced around 2034, 2035 by roughly 20%, maybe a little more. So how do you plan for that? And what does that conversation mean? So these are sort of all the strategies. And we're talking about how employers need to be involved, how individuals, how policymakers, plan sponsors, and that research pulls together sort of the whole environment ecosystem of retirement security for thinking about actions we need to take over the next 10 years to have a secure retirement for everybody. S something that I know is near to your heart, just from conversations, is just hearing themes when you're speaking at groups and things like that. Are, are two more items that I that I think are also reflected in the ethos of the the alliance, which is financial literacy 
and just uh, you know inclusive of Hispanics and uh, African American populations. Just what are your general thoughts around that? Uh, so when I, I know you, first, yeah, when I was in Social Security, some. I started and headed up the financial literacy initiative there, and we, we are we're changing the language, right? Behavioral economics and, and psychology. We're finding now as we talk about the term financial literacy, people say, "Well, you think I'm illiterate?" And so we're now changing. Uh, I didn't think about that. So we're changing it to financial <laughs> comprehension or risk comprehension. Like what risks do you actually, are you potentially exposed to in retirement? So it's a comprehension of risks and, and, and finances. But people had a hard time understanding, you know, again, what it meant to save and the, the power of compounding. They would hear these rules of thumbs because they're the heuristics that are easy to think about. Again, the 4% rule is one we hear about constantly that you can just draw down 4% of your assets when you retire. And that would basically make sure you don't outlive your uh, your savings, which again, we've all done research on this to show that's not always true. And even the, the terms we use on finances. Uh, so I've been beating this, you know, um, I guess tilting at windmills are making progress. For social security claiming, we call age 62 the early eligibility age. Age 67 is quote unquote normal retirement age. Then you've got age 70. What we don't tell people is the age 62 is your minimum benefit age and age 70 is your maximum benefit age, and that your benefits can increase roughly 8% a year on a monthly basis for each year you delay. And we literally would talk to people in field offices who were coming in at 62 because they wanted their early eligibility Social Security. And their point was, why would I ever be late to get my benefits? They didn't realize it was a minimum benefit. And you start telling them how much more they could get by delaying, and also like, well, I'll come back next year or the year after. And, and for Social Security, you can claim between 62 and 70. The modal age is 62. So we still have people claiming before their full retirement age. They're foregoing sort of that protection you'd get from an inflation-protected annuity, which is Social Security. And that's been my big thing about why I joined the Alliance, why I've been working with you guys, is making sure we have proper educational materials so that people can make an informed decision. I'm not saying what's right for someone or what's wrong for somebody. Yeah, I get it. You can't make an informed decision if you're not informed. And we need to do a better job with that information getting out there. And you helped redesign the statement too to show to, to make more clear the idea that if you delay, the benefit will be much bigger. I mean, one of the things, you know, we we kind of joke a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think, you know, as academics, we spend so much time with our words. For for people who are listening, if you just Google when to start receiving retirement benefits, Social Security, it'll pop up. It's it is a double-sided one pager. So two pages, but it's double-sided one pager. And there's a chart on there. It's a simple bar chart. If you were going to get $1,000 a month at your full retirement at 67, what would it look like at 66, 5, 4, 3, and of course at 2? And at age 62, it's about $720. And what happens if you wait till 70? It's about $1,370. Just showing people that bar chart, they didn't need to see any other words. They focused on that chart and said, wait, I can get more if I delay? Why didn't you tell me that? Like, <laughs> it's written down all over the... <laughs> <laughs> so the, the yeah, understanding yeah. the power of graphics and and I think and, and I say this is something that we're always trying including me to do a better job of we are always very careful and trying to make sure we're clear with our language that we're nuanced but we have to understand how people receive information and understand the best way to transmit information so they can receive and understand it and sometimes a lot of that is graphically that that graphic uh, weighed within the office is called the Jason Blue <laughs> <laughs> that's that's that particular blue. No, no, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, so, something with uh, with the uh, really research, I would say, because you're absolutely right. And and I want to say this because when we turned in our papers to you, uh, the accessibility, I, 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 you know, when we did our papers, you, you, you know, you you had them copywritten, but you know, so 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 they'd be accessible to everyone. So somebody listening in, I, I, you know, consumer specifically, I want them to know. They can get on and read these. They're they're very very approachable documents. And as much effort as made to write them, you know, in that first draft from that scientific standpoint, it, you know, Jason turns around and says, "Give me a sec." And you know, there, there's a process to make them approachable to everyone. Yeah. So I highly highly recommend them. Wouldn't you say, Jay, uh, Jason and Wade? I, I want to add also that all the papers we have on there, they're still peer reviewed. So, so it's, it's not, I, I want to make sure these are academic oh, yeah. papers, but one, they're peer reviewed. So we make sure that the research is impeccable and top notch. So they are journal quality. But then to your point, Alex, we go through with copy editors and people who speak, you know, 
quote unquote English and make sure it's understandable to a, a, an intelligent lay audience. And, and that's something that's important as well. And again, we make it so it's available to the public. So the media can use this and quote from it. You can cite, cite this and reference it. If someone's out there who's a finance professional and wants to give this to their clients, they can use that. They can link to it on our website. They can hand it out. That's what it's there for, right? We're only no. going to change the environment if we share information and do this together. So well, I that's think it's fantastic. I, I think that Peak 65 paper that, that you sort of led is that's almost like basic information that every every paper on retirement income needs to have that citation somewhere in their intro because it's just it's just a great resource of sort of you know epidemiologically hey, look this is what's going on you know this is what's present in the population that that sort of peak 65 so i i think it's fantastic Wait. Should I plug, plug, plug your research work? I'm you. waiting for that connection. Like, so now let's plug our yeah, work. Yeah. Well, you know, we're humble. I, 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 we got, wait, why aren't you far away? And how can we, let's see how we can find the transition into our paper in this. Just do it now. That well, was the transition. Yeah. So yeah. Back. I mean, uh, that David Blanchett article that you were discussing earlier, Jason, it, it's good to actually have research because he was able to look at like 100,000 or so planned participants to see that those who had protected income we're more comfortable staying the course compared to those that didn't. And we knew that just logically and like people who have protected income have risk capacity, but it was all anecdotal and yeah. actually have actual evidence on that now. It's really important. So there is a lot of great research coming out through the, the Alliance for Lifetime Income, uh, in, including three papers by- Speaking Alex of great research. <laughs> the, third one's coming, the third one's being published this week by the Alliance. This week is the, the third in the series. And it's- a detailed investigation of the RISA, the Retirement, Retirement Income Style Awareness, uh, with the first time we were able to look at a nationally representative sample, because our initial investigations were for the retirement researcher community, which many of whom may be listening to this podcast, they are a more intelligent subset of the American population in terms of their retirement income self-efficacy, their, their interests, well, like personal finance is a hobby. Yeah. Jason, did you see how you got out of that one? I was like, where's you going with that? <laughs> Especially after your literacy comment and everything. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, they have the financial literacy. So it was important to figure out, could people who don't live and breathe and read and listen to podcasts about retirement income planning uh, understand the the RISA. And that's what with 2,800 Americans in the survey between the ages of 50 and 80, we we're really able to pinpoint this idea that yes, there is something to this, that the retirement income style awareness describes factors that uh, lead to how people want to approach retirement income. And ultimately the, the punchline coming out of, well, there's three articles. I, <laughs> I believe the, the second article was the one that showed the 33% of Americans do kind of have a total return orientation where they may be comfortable with the logic of the 4% rule, the idea of just spending from an investment portfolio. But really two thirds of Americans at, in that retirement age range of 50 to 80 are looking for something beyond that. And that's where being able to have these conversations and this education around the idea of annuities not being a dirty word becomes important. And, and so being able to do that research through the Alliance for Lifetime Income was really a, a great opportunity for us. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if there's a question there. No, you're, you're good. You're Alex good. Always... <laughs> you're good. I, I'll, I'll add to this because you know, the, the importance from the Institute standpoint, from the Alliance's standpoint, is, is what you guys are doing is helping discuss the transition of how we've been planning retirement and how we should talk about planning for retirement. So way too often, it has been on this idea of accumulate, 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 get your nest egg, buy, have fun. And, and even for financial professionals, like we'll help you manage your assets in retirement with a still of a focus on accumulation. Yeah. Not on a focus on income in retirement so that you can spend adequately, preserve against risks and shock, et cetera. And, and to your point, what what your work does is shows there are, it's not a one size fits all profile, right? People have different risk assessments, different things they want to do. Some people still want access to growth, but maybe not a hundred percent access to equities and growth. What is their style of awareness? What is their profiling? How do you talk to people about those risks they might see? And then that sort of leads down to a solution set about here are some products that could fit in to make sure we're fitting in one, your financial needs, but two, also the profile that you're telling us 
Let me rephrase that. Sometimes they tell you they want something, but that's not actually what they really believe. And so your profiling gets yeah. to the idea of what do they actually need and what are they actually getting at in their retirement. And I think that's what's so important about this is we're showing it, you guys are showing it empirically, but it's giving an actionable tool. And again, I'm sort of agnostic on what styles are used, but we're promoting your research because you have something that we can put into action. And it's sort of saying, here's what the research shows, here's how a financial professional can use this to talk to clients. And here's how plan sponsors can use it. They start to think about what they want to do in plan for sponsoring annuity products. These are the conversations that have to happen if we're going to move the needle for retirement security and talk about income as the outcome in retirement. No, I, I think that's right. I, I think it's an extension of some of the research you said earlier in terms of when given a choice, a preponderance of people do want contractual income. They do want that guaranteed income. They just don't want to call it to begin with an annuity, right? No. And so all we did was surface these sort of implicit beliefs, if you will, in a framework. Uh, and, and within that framework, yeah, there, is, there are some people come hell or high water. They want an investment portfolio for everything. And we could, we could say the pros and cons and emphasize the cons on those. But, you know, to some extent, it is what it is. But if you have two thirds of the people that want a place for, you know, guaranteed retirement income or protected income, better said, then uh, it, it's our duty to start to start from there in terms of developing a solution set for them. And, and and I think that's what we found. We didn't realize that initially, I mean, we needed to replicate it with a national sample, but, you know, people can say, oh, there's retirement styles and, and you know, that could come across as pop psychology, if you will. But no, if, if you really put it through a strenuous psychometric test and, and actually realize, no, there are these factors that people believe in, probability, safety first, optionality, commitment, orientation. And if you align those in a matrix, they kind of, not kind of, they they have they they really delineate. They point to a style, and that style relates to certain solutions in which there is a strong home for contractual income. Hand over your heart, you've got to go with that. I mean, I mean, you just do. And then the third paper is, is interesting because you said some you said something right now where accumulation, 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 and guess what? More accumulation, right? And by the way. The only difference is we're just going to take a withdrawal every quarter and it's going to come out of the portfolio, but everything else is the same. There's new risk in retirement. Health, one, one of them that you just mentioned that you just need to accommodate for. You no longer have any human capital, so what are you going to do, right? And so with these new risks that you have in retirement, you kind of, you're not kind of, you need another way to assess these as opposed to the standard risk questionnaires that folks are using right now. And those risk questionnaires from an accumulation standpoint, Aside from the validity and reliability, let's just not even talk about that. Let's just give it to them, right? Let's just assume those assumptions, heroic assumptions work. Just call it a day, right? Uh, aside from that, okay, fine. We'll give it to you from an accumulation standpoint. But once you're retiring, that metric really falls very short of the mark. And that's what the third paper really gets at, where you control for all these factors with regards to retirement risk. Really... One's retirement income profile does a much better job of aligning to a strategy than than this sort of risk tolerance questionnaire. I, I think that's what the, the third paper really calls calls out. And when I'm, I'm, you know, obviously the numbers are the numbers, but I, I like the trajectory of okay, is is there such a thing as these retirement income factors? Do we have the right to say there's such a thing as a as you know as an academic? Can we say that? Yes. First paper is yes, we can say that. The second paper. Can these factors point to strategies consistently and validly? Yes. Do these factors explain above and beyond more variance than what is explained in risk tolerance questionnaires when it comes to retirement income solutions? Yes. You know, and from that vantage point, I, I think that's a cool trifecta. And I, I'm, I'm excited to, to be able to, you know, put that within the, the oeuvre of the Alliance for Lifetime Income Library. Yeah, and it's I, kind I would, of my way. <laughs> yeah, and I would, I would just add also, one of the reasons why I love this series is, is, again, it is forcing us to have a new conversation because we, we I, I don't want to say we've mastered the accumulation phase, but we've so much focused on it that we've got people convinced they need to save money, whether they do or not is another question. We've got people convinced they should. We've talked about diversification of assets, right? You shouldn't have everything in equities or everything in bonds. And now we're applying some of those narrative frameworks to the retirement decumulation income stage, right? You shouldn't have all your eggs in one basket. You have you should have a diversified portfolio in retirement that gives you what you need for your style, protected income, 
maybe some access to equities. What are your risks? What's your profiling? What, how do we fund your liabilities in retirement? And again, it's not one size fits all. Did you retire with your mortgage paid off? Are you renting? Do you still have a mortgage? Do you think you have health shocks? Right? These are all things you have to talk about when thinking Absolutely. about how to actually manage household spending in retirement. And that's what your profiling research allows us to start doing. No, I think it's good. I, I think it does something else, Jason, as well. And, and Wade brings us up. And I, I and we, br- we spoke about this last time, but, and it's a trite phrase. I, I think I said that last time as well, but it empowers the individual. I don't think individuals, consumers are aware that there's many ways to get this right. You know, there's many, I mean, you're, you're doing a heck of a job. You and Cyrus are doing a heck of a job getting the word out there for protected income. But the reality is you're fighting, you know, with, with all of these folks that are just saying, put it in a model portfolio, take a distribution, call it a day. You know, it, it's one of those things. But I, I think what, what, what we're kind of trying to bring to life from an empowering standpoint is letting them know there's many ways to get this retirement income strategy right. Actually, a majority of them involves a strong role for protected income. You know, you'll see the numbers bear that out. But from that vantage point, now that you're, you're, you know, now, now you're equipped with knowing that there's many ways to get this right, and you have a strategy that's pointing to one of these ways, that allows that person to then walk into an advisor and kind of lead that, lead that discussion. Obviously, you run the numbers, to your point. You run the numbers, see if it's valid, see if it's, you know, see if you can economically do this. But you're starting from a point that resonates with the consumer, as opposed to starting from the point of view of what the advisor wants to do with you based on his own personal proclivities. I think that's something that's important. And and I also want to just sort of, as we get close to wrapping this up, I want to talk about sort of like why I'm also still optimistic, because I think we're on the right path. So when when I started Social Security, I walked into the building and there was posters everywhere that said 62, 65, 70, because back then 65 was the normal retirement age. But but 62, 65, 70 was plastered everywhere, which gave sort of the behavioral impression that 62 was the age we were telling people to claim that because we had it first. Gotcha. Right? So reordering things in the statement, as Wade mentioned, we changed the statement. But when I remember reading financial press, whether it was Market Watch, you know, all the, the talking heads in Washington Post, you know, Wall Street Journal, they were telling people to claim benefits at 62 using what was called the break-even analysis, that if you claimed at age 62, you'd be ahead for 14 years. And the theory being that, again, if you wait till 70, you are foregoing several years of payment. Dial 40,000, dial 40,000. So <laughs> this, this is where, and the agency was doing this. So people were coming into the agency and we tell them, oh, the break-even says you should claim at 62 because you'd be ahead for 14 years. And we never told <laughs> them that if you live those 14 years, then you're then behind for the rest of your life. And we had to work really hard on you know messaging and stakeholders, so we, you know I would bring in congressional committees, AARP, Treasury, Labor, Education, all these folks, academics, and we work together to show the numbers about how people were, you know, you only know if you made the right decision after you're dead, right? When you're dead, you can look yeah, back yeah, and someone yeah. else can say, did you make the right decision? But we changed the entire narrative on the framing to making it a personal choice and then talking about the conditions and factors one must consider when making what is probably the most important decision of their retirement when to claim Social Security benefits. When I started with the Alliance five, six years ago. Same analogy, right? It's not very analogous. Annuities are bad. Don't get them. They're costly. There's only one product. They're all trying to screw you. And the financial press is saying the same thing. Now, just in the short time, because of our research and our outreach campaign and the education, we have done a complete 180 on the media where they're now saying, hey, there's not just one solution or one product. There are many. Talk to a financial advisor. Think about what conditions. Think about the risks you have. Think about your own sort of beliefs and structures, what you need to have for funding and retirement. We are now changing that. And we've done that in five years. And again, it's not pushing a product. It is pushing a new way of discussing the importance of income and retirement. Right. And that's why I feel I, so powerful. I, no, I think it's true. And, and I think if you, the 40,000 feet in the air, it's almost, there's a full circle in the sense of the retirement liabilities were on the corporate balance sheets, defined benefit plans. They said, hey, wait a second. I don't want these anymore. I'm going to shift these li- these liabilities onto the personal balance sheet. And all you're kind of getting at is, wait, how can we shift this away again from the individual balance sheet? Okay, fine. It's not going to be the corporate balance sheet, but maybe there's an insurance company that wants to bear that risk on their own balance sheet and provide a pension. 
it's kind of that that kind of cycle. Am, am I wrong in that, or does that sound about right? Sounds about right. To That's me. exactly right. And, and households on their own can't manage longevity risk, and they may struggle to manage the market risk. So having professional management, especially the longevity risk that a household can't even do anything about, uh, becomes very important in many cases. Well, Jason, like I said, this this time would fly. We always think it's 20 minutes, but here we are at, <laughs> at 45. We, we need to do that. We need to recreate that meme, you know, where they're drinking beer and say, look at us. <laughs> here we are, you know, kind of thing. And but I, I, we can go on forever. Do, I do want to come back and do a social security. No, no, we're, we're going to have, trust me, when, when we said your name, Wade said, oh, social security. He said, not yet. We're going to have a full, this is like an arc, <laughs> like the Avengers arc. We're going to have a full social security <laughs> on which... I mean, look, I mean, you're, you're the person for this. So, you know, it, it behoove us to, to have you. And it's a very comfortable conversation. So thank you. But, you know, we're going to, you know, this week, we're going to be pushing the papers that we just published. But also, you need to check out the Alliance for Lifetime Incomes Library. It is a treasure trove of information for consumers and advisors, too. Advisors, when they create their client presentations and, and things like that, you know, they start Googling for information. The reality is just go to the Alliance for Lifetime Income. Everything you need from a retirement from a retirement income standpoint is there. You know? And so I, I really, you know, thank you for, for putting that together for us. And I will say my goodbyes and I'll leave it to my man Wade to, to take us home. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. I feel like we should have Jason close us out after the great. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be great. <laughs> Jason, why don't you do the honors, man? <laughs> Alex and Wade, thank you for all the work you're doing. Um and it's important work. You should be very proud of it. And I'm very proud to be affiliated with you both. And the Alliance is proud to have you guys doing work with us. And to all your listeners, again, thank you for your time. Please do check out protectedincome.org. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're only going to be able to change the ecosystem by all working together. And that's employers, plan sponsors, policymakers, consumers. We have to change the ecosystem together. So I appreciate everyone's time. Jason's Thank great. You, He's going to have his own podcast soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. <laughs>